Please welcome Executive Director of the Institute for the Build Environment at Colorado State University, Lead Fellow Brian Dunbar. All right, thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. We are here for uh, an exceptional highlight at Greenbuild. Let me tell you why you're in the room. You're here to, to listen to a PhD, but he's a change maker. And he's a change maker. In urban acupuncture. Are you part of urban acupuncture? Is that why you're here? Or you want to learn about it? And listen to the P's I'm going to be talking about here. People-powered placemaking, participatory planning practices that produce small and socially catalytic neighborhoods that are more affordable, livable, walkable, workable, and equitable for all. We're talking about a 21st century eco-visionary who's received honors from places like Stanford and UC Berkeley and University of Pennsylvania. And his most recent enterprise called Streetwise was named by the White House as one of the 12 new innovative data tools that can help Americans connect to opportunity. And next week, hosted by President Obama, our speaker will be part of the Frontiers Conference at Carnegie Mellon. He's currently a professor at San Francisco State University, and it's my honor to present to you Dr. Antwi Akom. Join me. <laughs> You're the man. Thanks, bro. You're the man. You're the man. Appreciate right. you. Thank, Thank you. you. There's a lot of people here. I'll see you later. <laughs> so, um, hello, Green Build. Thank you for having me here today. Um, I want to get right into this because we don't really have a lot of time. I see a lot of familiar faces, and I'm grateful for all of you coming here. Um, to really have a authentic and meaningful conversation uh, about race and racial wellness and how it intersects with sustainability. So I want to start off uh, today with a video um, to really set the tone for some of the remarks that I'm going to make today with all of you. Failing to signal a lane change. Riding in your girlfriend's car with a child in the back. Running to the bathroom in your own apartment. Selling cigarettes outside of a corner store. Riding a commuter train. Walking home with a friend. Making eye contact. Selling CDs outside of a supermarket. Wearing a hoodie. Walking away from police. Walking toward police. Missing a front license plate. Holding a fake gun in the park in Ohio. Driving with a broken brake light. Sitting in your car before your bachelor party. Walking up the stairwell of your apartment building. Calling for help after an accident. Holding a fake gun in Virginia. On the way to Bible study. Holding a fake gun in Walmart. 
laughing. Holding a wallet. For attending a birthday party. Doing absolutely nothing. Not servile enough. Go to wearehearemovement.com to tell President Obama and Congress that the time for change is now. We demand radical transformation to heal a long history of systemic racism so that all Americans have the equal right to live and to pursue happiness. So I wanted to start with that video because we really can't talk about placemaking without talking about race making, right? And the ways that race influences both space and place. And the whole placemaking for low income communities and communities of color is really a lost art. We've gotten very good at placemaking for the 1%, but not with the 100%. And a case in point is gentrification. We know American apartheid still exists. We know we got here due to racist land policies. We know that there remain eco-haves and eco-have-nots. And we know that gentrification is just another word for ethnic cleansing. We've gotten good at building places, not just that poor people can't afford, however. Now we're talking about our librarians can't afford it, our teachers can't afford it, our firefighters can't afford it, our, our, our police officers can't afford it, designers, architects, planners. And our excuse many times is, well, we got in early, right? But what about the next generation of designers, of architects, of urban planners, of engineers? Where are they going to live and how are they going to survive? And I know that this concerns everyone in this room. And I want to start off my conversation with you today talking a little bit about myself. I spend most of my time in low-income communities, in communities of color, in jails, in prisons, in ghettos, in slums, or just hanging out with everyday people, many folks just like you, who often feel like their particular communities don't have a say in, the desi in designing the social and material conditions that impact their everyday lives. And I'm really excited about being here with all of you at, at Green Build. I'm energized on so many different levels because Green Build has its own identity. Green Build, when you say things at Green Build, you have the opportunity to really amplify your voice and to really speak to those folks who are designing the buildings, to speak to many communities that aren't able to get into spaces like this. And in the few days that I've been here, I've heard some really fantastic presentations. And part of what I've learned is that if you are a designer, if you are an architect, if you're an urban planner and an engineer, you're doing really powerful work. But if you are a compassionate designer, architect, planner, and engineer, you're doing more powerful work. And the same thing goes about if you are a more compassionate, just everyday person. And part of what I want to talk to all of you about today is weaving compassion into our everyday work and exploring these issues of race, of power, of identity. What are those essential qualities of mind, heart, and spirit that can bring us together as a people? And for example, I'm thinking about a couple of years ago when I came to Greenbuild in New Orleans. How many of you are in Greenbuild, New Orleans? Wow, a lot of returners. How many of you saw David Brooks's closing plenary? A lot of you left early. It was really good. <laughs> I'm calling you out. 
calling you out. So in David Brooks's closing plenary, he talks about these qualities uh, that are really powerful for bringing us together. And he talks about sometimes, and I think you should take a look at these, you have to give to receive. And he talks about how you got to surrender to those things outside of yourself to gain strength within yourself. He talks about how you have to conquer and eliminate your desire to get what you want if that desire means stepping on top of other people in order to get it. He talks about how success often leads to our greatest failure, which is pride and ego. And I know I have personally experienced that, and I bet many folks have experienced that in this room. And he talks about how failure, which I've also experienced quite a bit of, oftentimes can lead to our greatest success, which is humility and gratitude. And sometimes in order to fulfill yourself, you have to forget yourself. In order to find yourself, you have to lose yourself and undo everything you've learned. And that's part of what I want to do here with you all today about race in America. So part of what I really want to talk about are these questions of identity. Who are we in this country? Who are we as individuals? And what does it mean to be a compassionate designer, a compassionate architect, planner, engineer, and how does race shape our access to institutional resources and privileges? And I want to end, the second part of my talk is really going to be about the power of collaboration and undoing those things that we've learned so we can work better together. So I want to start with this statement about the built environment. The built environment is really a reflection of our cultural values. Is that right? Does that make sense? The built environment is a reflection of our cultural values, but at the same time, the built environment is not only a reflection of our cultural values, it's also a reflection of our moral values. And I started to really think about that, and I think you should start to really think about that. <laughs> when I was driving around recently in the Hollywood Hills, and I was thinking about whose values are being represented here, right? And then I was thinking about taking a walk through communities like Watts or Compton or South LA and thinking about the difference in the values in these different communities as manifested in the built environment. And what made me think about all this is returning to David Brooks, who I like David Brooks's books. I think David Brooks is a brilliant person. But David Brooks and I have really, really different lived experiences. And that lived experience doesn't mean that we can't collaborate. But in that closing plenary, where many of you left early, so you don't know, <laughs> this, is what, this is what he had to say. And I'm just going to read it to you. And I want to hear how, how this makes you feel. And then I'm going to share how it made me feel. So my favorite place on earth, uh, my favorite place on the face of the earth is Sharp Cathedral in France, another beautiful building which carries a moral power. And it's moral materialism. That is what America is about. We had people come to these shores. Europeans came to these shores hundreds of years ago. And they saw these endless forests, this unbelievable natural beauty, they saw flocks of geese so big that it took 45 minutes for them to take off. They saw the abundance of this country, and they had two thoughts. One, that God's plan for humanity could be completed right here. And second, they could get really rich in the process. So we are a moral and a materialistic culture. And when I join you, I see a group of people who are building things, who are part of the built environment, who are part of the economy, who are business people, but are trying to do it in a moral way. And so I really came here to Greenville to talk about that. Now, I'd love to hear how that made you all feel, right? But let me go back. When he says the Europeans came to these shores... A hundred years ago, I started to feel that sinking feeling. 
right, when I was listening to him, right? Not that Europeans didn't come to these shores 100 years ago, but all of the groups that are left out of that narration of how this country was founded was offensive to me, right? It did not capture my history. It did not capture the indigenous people that were here before me. I, I felt like many different social axes, axes, whether it was women, and now I'm sort of stretching, but this is what I felt. You can tell me what you felt, right? The LGBTQT population, so many people, I felt like, were left out of this conversation. And I was itching, two years itching for this moment. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> Two years waiting really patiently to have a conversation about how can we build, because I know we all want it, and I even think he wants it, a bigger, more inclusive, more dynamic tent, right? More diverse tent, right? Where we can all be a part of it. And so if we want to build this green topia in this larger tent, we cannot just do it for the 1%. We've got to do it with the 100%. And it's not enough to ask the kinds of questions that we've been asking about how can we build healthier communities? How can we build happier communities? How could we build greener communities? Those are all really important questions. But you first got to face the elephant in the room, people. The elephant in the room is race racial inequality and the way that structural inequalities like race, like class, like gender, like immigration status and other forms of social inequality structure and shape our cities past, present and future. And so the real challenge of the 21st century for designers, for architects and urban planners is how do we reimagine and redesign our cities for those communities that are generally locked out of sustainability conversations, locked out of smart cities conversations, locked out of shareable city conversations, locked out of social justice conversations. How do we redesign our cities not for, but with communities that are experiencing unimaginable forms of social trauma? Limited access to fresh and healthy food, unprecedented environmental threats. And to me, we have not correctly identified the problem. The Fed and HUD and EPA and the U.S. Green Building Council and Eco Districts and Green Star and other certification and rating systems have done a brilliant job and should be commended for the work they've done in terms of top-down ambitious goals for the design of the built environment. And I refer to that as the hardware. But what about the software, right? Our lived experience, the power of place, what we know to be happening on the ground level. Baltimore, Charlotte, Tulsa, Minneapolis, Oakland, New York, San Diego. I mean, almost every table here represents a different space or place in the United States, and this kind of police brutality has impacted all of our communities. And this kind of structural inequality, lack of access to jobs and housing, and the way that young black males are perceived by the police is totally impacting who has access to institutional resources and privileges. And how do I personally know this to be true? Well, the United States has 5% of the world's population, but 20% of the world's prisoners. Right? One, every, one out of every four people locked up, it's one out of every five people, locked up anywhere in the world is locked up in a United States jail or prison, and many of those folks are poor, black, Latino. And what happens to those of us who do get in, who have degrees from UC Berkeley and from Stanford University and from an Ivy League PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. Are our, are our outcomes any different? And so 
who's this? That's me. Do I look very happy? I'm not happy, right? I'm not happy because anyone who does a cursory Google search of me knows that I too have been a victim of racial profiling and my own civil rights violated and unjustly incarcerated. And my story is horrific, right? I am a single father at this time. This is back in 2005. And I'm taking, I'm at home, it's like 9.30 at night. And I'm thinking, wow, I need to get over to the university. I'm living in Berkeley at that time. And I'm like, I need to get over to the university in San Francisco to get some books to prepare, prepare for school the next day. So I have my two daughters. I put them in the car, and as we drive over, it's like a 40-minute drive, they fall asleep. And so when I pull up, they're, they're knocked out. And I'm in this dilemma situation of, ah, do I wake them up? And they were not that easy to put to sleep. And I know a lot of the parents are like, I feel you on that. <laughs> so I was like, you know what? I'm going to run up there and get my books and run back. I've never left them before, so before you go like, oh, on Twee, how could you do that? It was a dilemma, but I was like, you know what? I'm going to sprint in and be right back. I can do this. And so I was dressed exactly how I'm dressed, and I dressed up for you all today. So <laughs> thank you. And I, I locked the car. I parked like as close to the school as you can, I zip out of my car, I run up the stairs, and as I run up, I go up one flight of stairs, and there's a security guard at the front door. I didn't think twice about it, right? Got up, got into my office, got my books, came out. As I'm coming out, there is a, a young, 22 years old, white police officer who's walking towards me, and he says to me, put your hands behind your back, right? And I said to him, what everyone is thinking, which is, why? Right? Which you should never do. Right? That's what we've learned. Right? That's what we're talking about here today. Racial wellness, when, when a police officer asks you to do something, there's no, like, why? Just do it. Right? But at that time, I said, Why? Not even like that. Like, why? And he says, put your hands behind your back or I'm going to make you put your hands behind your back. Right? And I said, why again? Now, mind you, my office is right there, like right here. It says, Dr. Acomb, I have not been asked for my ID. Nothing. Right? At that moment, he knocks all the books out of my hands, drops down to his knees. Yeah, that's right wraps his arms around my legs and starts trying to wrestle me to the ground, right? Now, I'm holding on to him like this. I'm not a small person. So I have my hand on his shoulders. I'm looking at him I'm like, what are you doing, <laughs> right? And then about from, from here to the back of the room, there's some people standing as like there's people standing in this room. And I said to them, help, Right? And so he calls for backup. So two black cops come running up the stairs. One of them takes out their mace. I'm like, put the mace down. <laughs> Relax, what's going on? Right? Of course, in my mind, I'm like, and I said to them, I've got to get out of here. I don't know what's going on with you all, but my kids are in the car, i got to go. They said, okay. We are going to let you go, but we want to ask you a few questions. And they said, we just want to handcuff you, and then we're going to ask you a few questions, and then we're going to release you. I said, do what you got to do. Go ahead. Handcuff me. They said, sure. Put your hands behind your back. <laughs> okay, sure. So now I'm handcuffed, and I'm walking downstairs, and I'm, I'm like going towards my car. They take my head and shove me into the back of the police car, right? And they said, you're going to get one phone call. And if that person doesn't pick up the phone, 
we're going to take your kids to child and protective services. Now, I need all of you in this moment to go into your imaginations because this made me start to feel some emotions that I had never felt in my life before. Okay? And what it made me really think about and what I want you to think about is slavery. And I really started to think in a way that I had never thought about it before, and I'm a dark-skinned black male. Your mama being sold. Your daughter being sold. Your sister being sold. Your brother being sold. And you chained up, and you can't do a damn thing about it. You tell me what you would be feeling in that moment. Feel that. Allow that to sink in for a minute. Your little baby being sold, taken away from you, forever. That's what I was feeling in that moment. It's a, it's a lot of different emotions flying through you, right? And so they, they take me to jail, and luckily my friend did answer the phone. So he came out, he took my kids home, they take me to jail, and I'm in jail, and I'm starting to break bread with a lot of the other people who are locked up. And I start to learn, like, there's a lot of people locked up for really petty stuff. Like, way more than I had imagined. And I started to also learn that there is brilliance, there is genius in the jails. There are so many smart people. So much I could learn from. So we break bread, and finally, the universe, my friend comes and gets me out, and the university actually bans me from campus, right? Now, I was expecting an apology, like, hey, we're really sorry about that. That was some mix-up. What can we do to make it up to you? Instead, apparently, they thought I was going to sue them. So they decided to ban me from campus. That was their first move. And I was up for four felonies. Yeah, exactly. That's how I felt, by the way. Like, WTF? <laughs> and it hits hard, and it hits fast, right? And so there's media, there's this, there's that. I don't even know what's going on, blah, blah, blah. I'm banned from campus. <laughs> I've just been locked up. Da, 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 da. So luckily what happens is the lawyer, his name was, is John Kecker, who cross-examined Oliver North in the Iran-Contra affair, hits me up. And he's like, hey, I hear you're having some trouble. I got your back. I'm going to cover you pro bono, no problem, right? And he starts to change my life, right? And when that young man goes to court, the first time we go to court on these four felonies, the judge looks at him and she says, look, you said that Dr. Racon picked you up and drop kicked you down the hall and WWF'd you all the way here, but you don't have a scratch on you. Right? So yes, they falsified the police report. Right? And she dismisses all of those charges, and the university presses on. They still want to keep pressing charges against me, even though the criminal charges were dropped. And it was not until, and the reason I'm telling you this story is because it's also about the power of collaboration and how much help I got and the kind of social capital that I was able to get that how many other people don't have access to. So it wasn't until a very wealthy family, they may have more money than the entire CSU system, and the CSU system is the largest educational system in the world, came in and said, Antwi, we have your back. We will support you if you want to fight these folks. And it was at that moment when that kind of wealth stepped into the arena that they were like, hey, uh, you know, let's have a conversation here. 
how you doing, right? And so the point, there's many points of sharing that particular story. One of the points was to have all of you really begin to think about post-traumatic stress syndrome. And imagine hundreds of years of stress, right? Hundreds of years of trauma hundred, without treatment. What does that mean? Hundreds of years of racial terrorism that has been happening right here in our own backyard, right? We have to embrace the reality of what we've been living in. The Watts riots were 50 years ago. 4,000 National Guardsmen come into Watts. 34 people killed. 40 million in damages. The worst riots in the United States until Rodney King in 1992. And the same stuff is happening over and over again. We forget about these images. Look at this. I mean, it speaks for itself. The disconnect in our own humanity. I mean, just look at this. Like, people are smiling, hanging out. Where the picnic started. And that post-traumatic stress syndrome is one singular event. And when it happens to our troops, we understand it. When it happens to a group of people, and Joy Deguri talks about it as post-traumatic slave syndrome, and the characteristics of that being a foreshortened future, hypervigilance, difficulty falling asleep, emotional volatility, outbursts of anger. When we see this happening in people, black people, we wonder what's going on, right? Why are they behaving this way? And let me be really clear. I think black people and many people who have gone through this kind of trauma and oppression are the, the most resilient folks, right? So I think it's a story of resiliency. Don't, don't get it twisted and what we've overcome. But I want to highlight what happens when these behaviors happen over time for years and years and years. We start to call it, instead of just an outburst of anger, we start to call it culture, right? And that negative behavior and those negative elements of our behavior, we have to look at and transform. So mass incarceration has increasingly become a public health issue. In 1972, there were 300,000 people in jail. Now we're up to over 2.3 million. And what this is doing to our body is really profound. The medical research is crystal clear on what's going on inside of us. Okay, on the left-hand side is a vein without the effects of cortisol. On the right-hand side is when cortisol starts to clog our arteries, right? And this leads to the higher incidences of heart attacks, diabetes, and strokes in communities of color. And I just pulled this off the internet, but isn't it interesting that that looks like the shape of Africa? <laughs> and those, those, are, those are the people we're most affected. So after my own event, you may remember that Henry Louis Gates, the professor at Harvard, was also then uh, got into it with the police. And President Obama had to intervene at that time. And I went from being the poster boy for the professor who had been incarcerated to the national expert, right? And this is me on the Jim Lear News Hour talking about, yeah, listen to the police, right? And my point in sharing this is that race matters in the structural shape of our cities. It matters in our personal experience. Race is always there coloring our psychology, our, physio our physiology and our perceptions of space and our access to institutional resources, and we too often forget about it. We too often act like that's not happening when it is in fact happening. And 
we forget about it because we're not aware of this term implicit bias, which is the unconscious stereotypes, the cultural norms of how we were collectively raised. And folks of color, even in video sim simulations, are perceived as a threat, right, more than any other groups. So there's this continuing significance of race that I want to make sure that we understand. Race subsumes social class. There's racism in the heart of liberalism. We racial profile entire communities. And as I said earlier, gentrification is another word for ethnic cleansing. So what can be done about this? What can all of you do? All of us do. What if we build a new green building movement at the intersection of social justice and of ecology, of human rights and activism, of interchange and outer change? What if this new movement places diversity, equity, and inclusion in the center and commits to protecting our nation's most vulnerable populations? What if we don't just build hybrid cars? What if we build a hybrid movement? Did you all like that? Would that be good? Okay, yeah. You can, we can have some emotion. <laughs> just show, show some emotion. So the, the first step towards this um, healing and healing the racial divide in our country would be that we have to move from racial sickness to racial wellness. And so I want to offer quickly a racial wellness toolkit. And the first part would be we have to learn how to tell the truth. Because when we don't tell the truth, we get sick, right? Lying makes us sick. And so we've got to learn how to tell the truth in similar ways that South Africa has tried to tell the truth with the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions. Rwanda has tried to tell the truth. We need to embrace our own history. That would be step one. Step two, we have to identify with our nation's most vulnerable populations. We love innovation, we love technology, we love green buildings, we love entertainment. But if we don't infuse these with diversity, with equity and inclusion, then we're failing. Three, the disconnection that you saw in the picture of the person being lynched. Part of racial wellness means we have to stop being disconnected from the suffering of other people. Right? We've got to start really identifying with the needs of other people and recognizing each person's humanity is connected to our collective humanity. In South Africa, they have this term called Ubuntu, I am because we are. And we've got to embrace that in our work and in our practice. And finally, we've got to really think about that each of us is more than the worst thing we've ever done. Each of us is more than the worst thing we've ever done. And I say that, my daughter makes me think of that. Because lots of times, how many of you have children? Then you know, lots of times they judge you on the worst thing you've ever done. <laughs> That's where this one came from. It's like, hey, hey, I'm a lot more than that, right? But they'll be like, no, you did this, right? And it's really important that we remember that that's really just a small part of who we are, right? When you've done something not right in your life, we don't want to stay fixed on that. And the last one is to really stop thinking of low-income communities and communities of color as marketplaces, right? Oftentimes, we, we act as if the work that we're doing is all about transforming the market and we put profit over people instead of people over profit. And we need to stop that kind of thinking if we want to build trust in the very communities that we're working with. So I have a question for all of you. Can our green building movement really help make communities immune from gentrification? By a raise of hands, how many of you believe that we can actually, this community can help make the people who we work with and the cities that we work with immune from gentrification. It's depressing, like 12 people. I mean, right, people are like, we have to, but there's 12 people. There's only 12 of us who think it's possible. So I'd love to know what the other ones you think about. It's just like, well, gentrification's happening. Hey, it's, it's, we're good. We got in early, right? <laughs> 
We got in early. So to make communities immune from gentrification, I want to just give three quick examples. One, and of course, these are not perfect examples, but there's only 12 of us who raised our hands, right? So one, I think what's happening in the tenderloin in San Francisco was worth lifting up, where you had, we're talking about blocks from Twitter and blocks from Uber, some of the wealthiest companies in the world, the nonprofits bought up 25% of the property, right? So the city and the nonprofits own the property, 25% of the housing stock is either owned by nonprofits or subsidized by the government, and that kind of community control means that even when these luxury high-rises come in and folks are wanting to put coffee shops on the bottom that no, no one in the community really needs, the community has control. I think another example, and this one is much more well-known, is really Dudley, Dudley Street, right? But there, I think what's powerful was the ability to use eminent domain to take the land, right? And to build 225 units of affordable housing through community land trust. And they, they also convinced the city to, to sell for dirt cheap vacant lots, which they then converted into urban gardens to actually feed the community. So this is another great example of trying to make a community immune from gentrification. And then IOBI and the work of Aaron Barnes does really amazing work, and, and they have a project in Cleveland, a bridge that bridges, which is about how we need to be including art back into these conversations. And there was this bridge that divided the black community from the white community, and they, everybody got together, and the community raised a couple of thousand dollars to heal and bridge the racial divide through the practice of art and people expressing what they thought would heal the community. And so what we learn from this collectively is that we can actually make communities immune from gentrification if we aggressively build new and affordable housing, not just low-income housing, but also for the missing middle. If we reduce or freeze property taxes, this was especially true in places like Texas. If we have baseline protections for vulnerable populations. I'm not going to go through all these, but take a picture of this slide if you like it. <laughs> this, this slide will also be in Doug Farr's new book, uh, about uh, sustainable America. And how do you pay for this? Go back. <laughs> Go back. Dan, what's the name of Doug Farr's new book? Uh, he's got a different name than sustainable urbanism that goes to the world, and I can't remember it. All right, whatever. Dan's in the book, too. So <laughs> check out his chapter. And he's got a great new fiction book coming out. Anyway... Um, how do we pay for this? Because a lot of people are always like, hey, that sounds like a great idea, but how do you pay for it? So I think it's really important that we, we reflect on the example of Minneapolis, Minnesota. And in Minneapolis, they did something really creative, which is they took one half of the commercial real estate tax right, from, from the corporations and they invest it in the poorest parts of the city. Right? And so everyone gets access to high quality civic and green infrastructure, schools, parks, playgrounds, etc. So that eliminates this idea that, oh, we can't find ways to pay for it. It's actually much more about sharing, right? And figuring out new ways to distribute our resources. And Minneapolis is a great example of that. And what about walkability? If sitting is the new smoking, then walkability is the secret sauce to really complete communities. And walkability for whom? And drawing on the women's liberation movement and the civil rights movement, Morgan Dixon from Girl Trek reminds us how walking is the real wonder drug. And I want you to quickly hear her story. Good morning. My name is Morgan Dixon. I'm out for my morning walk. I'm a part of an organization called Girl Trek that has rallied and mobilized 10,000 black women and girls to take a step out and to walk for their health together across the country from our communities out of the front door. We walk five days a week, 30 minutes a day, 
for eight weeks straight to re restart, jumpstart, kickstart healthier lives and to combat these statistics that say we're going to die earlier, younger, at higher rates than any other group in the country. Four out of five of us are over a healthy weight. All of this is preventable. We know that walking changes things. When black women walk together, it has always changed things. When women in Montgomery walked, it changed. When Harriet Tubman walked, it changed. And when we walk, things will change. I look forward to telling you more about this incredible organization. 10,000 women are on the streets now from places like Chattanooga to Detroit, and we are walking it out for our health. Look forward to talking to you more. Can you give Morgan a hand? So girl, organizations like Girl Trek are transforming the green building movement from this hero uh, sort of top-down movement to a bottom-up movement and a bottom-up approach. And, but the real question becomes, how do we scale that? Right? And for us, we think that the missing link is really what we refer to as people-powered placemaking, which is real-time two-way communication between everyday people and cities so that everyday people can participate in the design solutions that impact their everyday lives. And I know that that has to be something that would be very attractive to many of the people in this room. And our way of doing that has been building a platform called Streetwise. And what Streetwise is, is a mobile mapping and SMS tool that collects real-time data about how people are experiencing cities and services and turns that into actionable analytics. Right now, much of the data that you all get is geospatial data that says, oh, you live near a park, right? And that proximal data is great. You want to know if the person lives near a park. But what you really want to know is what's their experience in that park, right? Is that the park where the drugs are sold? Is it safe enough to bring your kids to the park? Do the swing sets even work at the park? And so Streetwise addresses these kinds of questions like, how can we have more inclusive community engagement processes? And how can we use data to make better and more community-informed decisions? In a nutshell, how do you democratize data and how do you democratize decision-making? And it answers questions that are happening beneath secondary data sets. Like walkability is a great example. There's things out there like WalkScore that tell us how walkable a neighborhood is, but walk score doesn't differentiate between liquor stores and grocery stores, right? So you could be living, and I'm gonna show you an example, in a community that has a lot of liquor stores and have a very high walk score, right? Same thing goes for walk score doesn't give us data that I might feel very safe walking down a particular street or alley, but the women in the room would not feel safe walking down there. Where's that showing up on any kind of data set? Right, so what we've done is created a systematic way to address these kinds of questions around walkability, public transit, affordable food, where do I go if there's an emergency? We were the only real-time platform provider, crowdsourced platform provider to be invited to the billion dollar National Disaster Resiliency Competition. And there emerged this conversation and this disconnect between where people wanna go or say they're gonna go if there's an emergency, that is the official place, and local knowledge. And people were like, I don't even know where the official place is, right? But where we would go is we would go to the church, which is also a healthcare center, which is also a tutorial center, right? And that kind of information is critical because that means that's where we should be targeting our investment. So Streetwise begins to answer these kinds of questions. And a great example of the power of the platform is this is a data set that we drew from Open Oakland. So if you all went to Oakland and searched Open Oakland in East Oakland and you were looking for the number of, of grocery stores in East Oakland, this is the data set you would see. And all of those purple dots represent grocery stores. And so to all of you, it must appear as if East Oakland is a veritable food oasis, correct? Right? Lots of food. But with Streetwise, once you ground truth that information, what you find out is that a lot, all of those, were not, many of those were not really grocery stores. They're actually liquor stores and corner stores. And only a handful are actually grocery stores. And then we provide pictures and audio and video, right? And that's because 
and we're also bilingual and we can be multilingual in a matter of six weeks because we want to make sure that we can reach different literacies and different kinds of populations. Right? And right now what we're going to do is show you a video from a young woman who's narrating uh, food security in her own neighborhood. Okay, so what are you, let's see, um, what are you looking at? How was it when you went inside? It was dirty when I went inside and I would never eat anything in there. Do you consider this to be a grocery store? Hell no. Why? Because it's, they don't sell any groceries and it's just a bunch of junk food in there. And I mean, they have little sandwiches, but I would never eat that cause, because it's dirty. And then all the fruit is all like old, like wrinkly and looks old. And then all the like meat that they did have, like the bacon and all that and the little thing, looks like it's been sitting in there for about a year or something like that. I wouldn't call it a grocery store at all. So, hell no, I wouldn't eat there. So you can imagine the, the power of this kind of data that you could use in your own work so that communities can actually be involved in transforming the social material conditions that are impacting their everyday lives. And we're working with eco districts and I think eco districts should really be commended for their new protocol that's coming out and for the work that they're trying to do on embedding within that protocol bottom up ways that the community can be involved. And I would say the U.S. Green Building Council through LEED is trying to do that and we still have more work to do but there's some really great people working on, on that. Um, for Streetwise, we've had amazing success. Uh, as, as Brian said earlier, the White House named us as one of the 12 new innovative data tools that have come out. We're launching in partnership with eco districts and their target cities. We are a platform provider for 100 resilient cities. And in San Diego, they used Streetwise and they discovered arsenic in the drinking water. And the win was to transform the drinking water and create safer drinking water for kids. In the middle of the state, in Merced, California, we identified a transportation gap between where low-income folks live and where the jobs actually are. And so we were able to relocate the bus stops closer to where the people actually live. And then we just showed you the great work that we've done about transforming um, food deserts into food oasis in Oakland, where the win out of that was farmers, a farmer's market, was food, a food commissary, a multi-million dollar food commissary. And um, in the end, we were also able to partner with the California Fresh Fund to start working on transforming the kind of food that was available in the actual liquor stores to fresh and healthy food, right? So the, the platform is having really amazing re results in terms of changing people's access to institutional resources and privileges. And the kind of value that we add is Streetwise creates democratic models of civic engagement. It gives communities a way to collect, analyze, and share data. It's a bottom-up process where local knowledge meets community-engaged design. It's one of the few tools out there that can measure different kinds of resiliency, social resiliency, cultural resiliency, physical resiliency, and climate resiliency. It's a powerful platform to prioritize public investment. It's an early warning system where we can integrate community generated data with big data in order to really identify hot spots and cool spots and to uh, predict and track future trajectories and investment and it's one of the tools that can create more sustainable shareable equitable and just communities for all and the secret to our success has really been taught to me by Brian Stevenson who's a civil rights lawyer and you should check out his TED talk it's really amazing but he taught me that ultimately we will not be judged by our technology, we will not be judged by our innovation, we will not be judged by our intellect and by our reason. Ultimately, we will be judged not by how we treat the rich, the powerful, and the privileged, but by our compassion for people who have less power than us, by how we treat the most vulnerable, how we treat the condemned, the incarcerated, that is how we will be judged by our efforts. And I'm inviting all of you to really stretch out and begin to expand your own humanity into populations that you're generally not used to working with, perhaps. Perhaps you are, but perhaps you're not. And 
I came tonight to Green Build because I believe that the moral arc of the universe is long and it bends towards justice, but it only bends towards justice if we incorporate justice into our hearts and our minds and our daily actions. And if we do this, we'll regain the lost art of placemaking, not just for the 1%, but with the 100%, and overall, we will be happy. I could not believe no one clapped. You all are, <laughs> you're just so boring. I mean, I hate to put you down like that. I have compassion for you, but it's like people should be clapping and feeling themselves, but they're just like, I mean, for the song, not for me. But join us in building a new community driven revolution that integrates the power of local knowledge with official knowledge that helps all communities become more transparent, open, connected, smart, shareable, and equitable for everyone. Thank you so much for your time. Wow, I'm shocked. Oh, wow, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. On Tweet, you've been a, uh, a great master speaker for Greenbuild, and I think uh, I'm not alone in saying we need you to be even more than a master speaker, uh, a plenary speaker in the future wow. for us. We all need to hear your message. Wow. Thank you. Uh, I'm, riveting. I'm riveting. I am stunned, honestly. <laughs> I was not expecting that. Um, some of this I have spoken about before, and some of it I hadn't. And, you know, I have a lot of really good friends in the audience, Deb and Dan and Aaron and Rob, blah, 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 you know, JC, I could name everybody, but the point They're is... They're all here. <laughs> a lot of people it. had me thinking about this, the value piece and the moral piece, right? And I really wanted to lift that up because I feel like that is really what we need to bring us all together, right? Is to be thinking more about how do we manifest our values and our morals and our daily practices and how we reach outside of ourselves and build with people who are not like ourselves and having that compassionate leadership. And so I've been giving that a lot of thought and you're the first audience I've really woven that sort of story into um, talking about compassionate leadership and what that would mean, and I'm really touched that it touched you. So, thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>